Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating, from the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day. Each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is, who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. Hello, and how are you doing? And welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for tuning into the show today. Wow, we have some interesting topics today. In the first hour, we're going to be speaking about New Orleans voodoo. And in the second hour, we're going to be speaking about the way of the weirdo. Do you know anybody that's weird? I don't. Anyway, uh, Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com. It's the website you can go to to find out about all the services I offer, including medical intuition evaluations, clairvoyance, a.k.a. psychic readings, or energy medicine, uh, energy healing services. It's also loaded with articles and products and all kinds of great stuff. Tons of pages, lots to look through. Please do go there and enjoy. It's also brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. And please do go to the Just Energy Radio webpage, that's www.justenergyradio.com, and check out all of the archives that we have on the site uh, there and available to you. Just Energy Radio is also being broadcast or put out on YouTube weekly, and so that's a new place where you can go and check out the show archives. It's Just Energy Radio on YouTube. However you find it on YouTube, it's on Just Energy Radio. Um, So let's see. Let me tell you a little bit about Kanaz and get him on the air because we're going to be talking about New Orleans, Party City. Anyway, (laughs) after a decade of solitary service to Iowa, the spirit of Haitian voodoo, in 2003, Kanaz Filan was initiated at Society La Belle Venus No. 2, a voodoo house in Brooklyn, New York. Kanez is the author of a Haitian voodoo handbook, Voodoo Love Magic, Drawing Down the Spirits with Raven Kadera, and his new book, The New Orleans Voodoo Handbook. So please welcome to Just Energy Radio from KinezFilon.com. Kinez, hey, how's it going? Hey, it's Rita. Glad to be here. Hello, audience. I hope everybody's having a wonderful day. I'm doing great. Hey, I didn't know that you had like a new baby, but I saw your we picture just, on Facebook. She, yep, she is just was ten weeks old. It will be eleven weeks old on Monday. She's growing like a weed. Anna Maria Sieg in Estelle Island. You know, we're quite happy with her. We think we'll keep her. Although sometimes at two thirty in the morning, when she's doing her impression <laughs> of ground glass in a blender, we sort of reconsider, but not for long. Oh, no, wait till she's about 16. Then you'll be like, gypsies, where are the gypsies when you need them? <laughs> Take my child, I'll pay you. <laughs> so the but last... No, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Hello, go ahead, no, 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 go ahead. Then. The last time you were on, we talked about voodoo in the general sense of the word. We had never really done a show on that topic at all. And we talked about a number of the different spiritual beings that get called upon in this practice. And your new book, the New Orleans Voodoo Handbook, um, talks about, obviously, New Orleans Voodoo. And I guess I didn't realize that there were different styles or types of voodoo out there. There are, well, 
there are several different types of voodoo, like voodoo. There is, new, of course, Haitian voodoo, which is the voodoo that's practiced in Haiti. When you get across the border in Hispaniola to the Dominican Republic, you have among the Haitians there and among a fair number of the Dominicans something that's called voodoo dominicano. The Haitians who came to Cuba do voodoo cubano, and then you have like voodoo, which is like actually it's a nasalized U as a, as a French thing, which is like the voodoo which is practiced in Benin and Togo, which is where many of the slaves who formed these various voodoos came from. Then there is like the famous New Orleans voodoo, which is the folk magic that was practiced among the African American community in New Orleans. And that's the old, that's a fascinating story in and of itself. That's you know and so fascinating. In fact I decided to write a book about it. Right, and we'll get into that because obviously that's a really important part of what we're going to be talking about. Plus, I was like, woohoo, New Orleans! I love New Orleans. It's just yeah. a great city. Um, I can honestly say, out of all the books I've done, I don't think I've had as much fun researching. It's like if this book is half as much fun to read as it was to research, it's a go. It, you know, it should be a bestseller. I just had a ball writing about New Orleans. There's just so many fascinating stories, so many interesting characters. I, New Orleans is just such an amazing city. It's well, it's the northernmost city in the Caribbean, in, in many ways. I mean, there's a lot of ways. It's a quintessentially American city, yet there's also a quintessentially foreign city, which I find, you know, it's very, it's just, it's a fascinating place. And, you know, it's, like I said, I had a ball with it. You can't, I think everybody who, like, comes comes to New Orleans falls in love with the city. That's it. Everybody I know that's ever been there is just like, you know, thinks it's the greatest place on earth. Even the ones who are like, you know, I've never lived there, but, like, boy, do I love to visit. I think it's interesting because it is, you know, they talk about New York being a melting pot. But I think New Orleans, you know, maybe it was the first melting pot in the United States, but, you know, there's the Spanish culture, there's the French culture, there, there's all there's kinds the, of oh, different things that, was that are I going that on there. When I started right there, you know, I mean, it's like you've got the Acadians, or as we call them, the Cajuns. You've got the, there's a large Sicilian population in New Orleans who brought a lot of the spirits with them, you know, like, San Expedite, if I recall correctly, was actually started by an Italian monastery. So it's like, and we all know how popular Expedite is. That's the spirit saint. Hurry up, the one you come to when you've got desperate, like when you need something done and you need it done fast. <laughs> but there's just so, I mean, muffalettas, which are just one of the fate, like, you know, muffle, like if you're ever in New Orleans and you, like, get a chance, have a muffaletta sandwich, you'll love it. And that's, that came in with the Sicilians, you know, beignets, pralines which came in, of course, with the French. You've got, like, just Jean Balaya, which is really close to Senegalese wall-off rice with a couple of extra bells and whistles thrown in. You've got the, Cong the slaves that came to the Congo brought okra with them, or as they call it, Ngombo, and that becomes gumbo. And it's just, it's such an, like you said, it's a melting pot. It's an amazing city. Now you have a huge Vietnamese influence coming in, and you've got a very large... You had the Spanish influence and the Spanish occupation. You've now got, as people are rebuilding New Orleans, you've got a lot of construction workers coming in from Mexico and Central America. So you've got that, like, Hispanic Central American thing going on. It's just, New or well, New Orleans is a port city. New Orleans basically, like, New Orleans is like an old brothel. It welcomes all comers. I don't know how else to say it. It's just <laughs> everybody can come to New Orleans and, like, you know, you can come to New Orleans, you can make a home there, and you can become a part of it. That's the other thing I, know, I found that I was really fascinating to me was how many of the people who have become, like, really legendary within New Orleans weren't actually from the city itself. I mean, there was, like, you know, Leafy Anderson who created, you know, the spirit, this Black Hawk Spiritualist Church, which is just, like, an incredibly powerful and fascinating tradition, was from Chicago, Frank Staten, who became known as the Chicken Man, was from Chicago. Sally Ann Glossman, who's just doing wonderful, wonderful work there, is also from like, from Indiana. Like Miriam Shermani came there from the Midwest. There's just people come to New Orleans. It's like the city calls you and you come there, and if that's where you belong, you can make it your home. It's a That was something that I found really, really fascinating. Well, you know, most people just associate it with the music and the drinking. <laughs> And Mardi Gras, yeah. which we'll talk about Mardi Gras. But, you know, like if you're 
the ghost hunter, which, you know, like I like my ghosty people. We were walking around going into some of those old buildings. We went to this one place, which I'm going to talk, we'll talk a little bit more about, but we walked in the door. It was a restaurant, and I just went, okay, freaking haunted. Mm-hmm. And I'm just standing there looking around going, haunted, haunted, haunted. So we took a bunch of pictures while we were in there. Like, you know, oh, here, let's take a picture in front of this <laughs> wall mural you know as i'm going click 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 <laughs> but it it has you know and it has those great cemeteries i mean it just has something i think for everyone and you know even though this isn't one of my big things but it has the national world war ii museum there too which we spent five hours in um <laughs> which was kind of yes, interesting no, I, if you like war stuff that is really interesting the cemeteries are Really fascinating because New Orleans is essentially a city built on a swamp. You have to have a lot of elevated cemeteries because they tried burying people and they noticed that every time there was a heavy rain, the people they had buried were rising. Or more precisely, the coffins they buried them in. So it's like, you know, one after a couple of floods and you start seeing like cast, like last year's caskets going down Main Street you start building the more traditional French and Spanish style elevated mausoleums. And that's, you know, the mausoleums of New Orleans are just one of my, there is very, like, I find that throughout the southern United States, you just find some really amazing cemeteries, but I've never seen a place anywhere that held a candle to the New Orleans cemeteries. I agree. Well, and even the history with some of the, um, the crypts, you know, and they would, t- you know, because we <laughs> we went on one of the ghost tours to uh, to go see uh, Marie Lebeau's tomb, which we'll talk about Marie, you know, a little bit later on. But you know, he was telling us about how some of them are still in use and how they would put the newly deceased person in there and they'd leave them in there for a year and a day and then take their ashes and kind of put them in a little plastic bag and move them over to the side. And there was like hundreds of years worth of people in that one little box thing. Yeah, that absolutely happens. That's you have just some uh, people will get buried there for a while and it's like it the heat the inside those tubes. If, if you were in New Orleans at any just about any time, we were there in November and it was just like, you know, I think it was ninety degrees with that classic New Orleans like a like a large dog is breathing in your face humidity. And I can imagine, like, the summertime, those tombs, basically anything that's put in there is kind of slow-baked, cremated. So within a year or so, there isn't really too much left, and you can move it aside and, like, you know, this is now the resting place of someone else. So, yeah, Mm -hmm. you have just all kinds of people buried in there. And that's, you know, you have some um, just so many. Did you make it to the St. Roque Cemetery, the the cemetery with the monster St. Roque statue? I don't know. We went to the one, um, you know, by Bourbon Street, and then we went to one that was in the Garden District somewhere. I know I the one know. you're talking about. It, St. Roque is in the area, the area around the St. Roque Cemetery. is one of the rougher neighborhoods in New Orleans. So a lot of people don't really go there. You know, it's probably you need to be a little cautious going there because much as I love the city, you have to admit it's got a crime It's got a scary crime rate. Mm-hmm. And, but when you get there, there is essentially about an eight-foot-tall statue of St. Roque who has, was based, who was, a, the original story was he was a noble, the son of a nobleman who went, like did a lot of holy things, came back to the city as a mendicant, as a you know, as a beggar, a wandering hermit beggar, was put in prison in the city of Montpellier, France, and you know died there. He because he didn't want to tell anybody he was the son of a noble because that would be rising, you know, that would be setting himself above the like God's poor. But since that time, he's just done a lot of miracles. He was given credit for saving a whole parish from an epidemic of yellow fever, which hit in the 19th century, like. New Orleans used to have just horrifying every time during the summer the mosquitoes would come in, and if you didn't get yellow fever, you might get malaria. So, but this parish, during a really bad epidemic, the priest said, I will build a shrine to you, St. Roque, if you'll protect the parish. Not one member of the parish got yellow fever. Nobody got it. I mean, that's just that's unheard of. Like Nobody in the whole parish got yellow fever. So he built this shrine... People started coming there asking St. Roque for healing, and they'd get these miracles. Like, 
many, many people credit him with healing. And what they do is, you know, well, I was lame and St. Roque healed me, so I'm going to leave my brakes here. You'll see crutches there. You'll see braces. You'll, you'll see eye patches. You'll see, like, all of these medical things which, you know, well, I don't need them anymore because St. Roque has healed me. You'll also see, like, retablos. Retablos, I think is what they call them in Mexico, the little pictures of, like, these, like, these are the body parts that St. Roque healed all over the place. And just to add the extra touch of Southern Gothic, the place is swarming with palmetto bugs. For those of you listening who don't know what a palmetto bug is, just picture a cockroach that took Schwartz steroids till it's about the size of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Palmetto I am so glad are... I did not go there then, because I'd be like, ah, ah. No, and I, yeah, it was like, I mean, it's just this. But the cemetery itself is magnificent, and the statue, just this enormous statue of this, he had a dog, a faithful dog he carried with him, and he had a sore on his leg. So he's showing this sore as he's got the faithful dog with him, and he's staring out there at you, and he's just surrounded by all these old medical implements while palmetto bugs crawl all over the place. It's just... William Surreal. could not have made this place up. <laughs> I'll bet. And, you know, in listening to your description, we definitely did not go there. I think we went to St. Yeah, no, Louis Cemetery. That. You know, I, we would have remembered that. I mean, what you I remember the was, like, there was this one giant crypt that was for, you know, this orphan thing. You know, I should, like, open up my little pictures because I got, like, millions of pictures of that cemetery, plus the name of it because I took a picture of that. <laughs> but, um, no, New Orleans is a great city, the music, everything. Um but let, let's go back to the voodoo, because I could just talk about New Orleans forever. Let's go back to the voodoo part. How did how did New Orleans as a city become kind of synonymous with voodoo? I mean, you think of, you know, what things people uh, – cities are associated with. You know, you think San Francisco, sourdough, sourdough bread, you know, or New York, you know, hot dogs. That's a and long story. New Orleans is like – a lot of it really starts – in the 1930s, during the Depression, like there was a guy named Robert Talent who worked with another guy named Lyle Saxon compiling New Orleans folk stories for the, New or- for the WPA project. The two of them wrote a book together called Gumbo Yaya. And he's like, and it's like, if you get a chance, Gumbo Yaya just has so many fascinating tales of like the city of New Orleans and the old like history there. Then from there, he became, Talent became really intrigued by the spiritual practices there, and he wrote two books that became very popular. One of them is called Voodoo in New Orleans, and one of them is called, like, Marie Laveau, the Voodoo Queen. And those two books really started people getting fascinated by, hmm, you know, there's some unusual spiritual practices that are being done in New Orleans. In a little later in the 70s, there's a guy named Charles Massico Gandolfo, who was like part of the old families in New Orleans, like old families in New Orleans, and he sets up something called the New Orleans Voodoo Museum. And he tended to, like to. I love Charles Massico Gandolfo. I couldn't, I cannot say enough how much he did for the city of New Orleans. But both he and Robert Talent kind of had this. They never let the facts get in the way of an entertaining story. I think that's the most charitable way I could put it. So they were like a lot of stories about the history of New Orleans voodoo were are fairly modern and they were created for like entertainment effect. That being said, you know, they they became I don't know how else to say other than truer than true. I mean they were very they were true like, you know, they might not be exact, like you know, they might not be exactly historically true, but they resonated with people so much that you know people started coming there and doing their own spiritual practices. Sally Ann Glassman is an initiated Mambo in Haitian Voodoo who came there and set her own house up. She's doing some fascinating stuff. You also have you know Miriam Shamani who's got the Voodoo Spiritual Temple, which is just an amazing, amazing place. It's near Congo Square. If you ever get a chance, absolutely well, well worth seeing. You know, and I think what happened was just New Orleans has this very mystical. You know, New Orleans feels like no place else you've 
I've ever been. I mean, we're talking it's just energy, so let's just say it. I'll come out and say it. The energy of New Orleans is not like any American other city in the United States, and I'd argue it's not like any other city in the world. There's something unusual there. I don't know what it is or where it comes from, but there is something about the city of New Orleans that is very different than the stuff that's been, like, the surrounding areas. It's very different than everything around it. You know, it's the one thing. It's got a culture that's like like a Francophone culture, a Spanish culture. It's one. It's a very, very Catholic city in the midst of the Bible Belt, which is very Protestant. You know, it's like I think it's because it seems so alien and so unusual to a lot of people. They're like, well, the spiritual practices that are done here are like real alien and really strange. And then people just started studying them, and then some people started making up their spiritual practices on their own, and they became part of Haitian of New Orleans voodoo. And, before you know it, you got New Orleans voodoo. I mean, one of the things about New Orleans is that there are so many different, I want to say, layers to it. You know, there's the just the party scene layer, you know, and then there's, you know, and the people there seem really friendly, but in the same breath, you could feel this, not, you know, I'm going to say darker element, not just, you know, from, you know, bad people, but just... I, I always kind of – one of the things that we did while we were there, it was like on a Sunday, and they had all the little people set up out in the courtyard, square area. Um, and so we were walking around, and there was, you know, all these people doing tarot readings. And I'm like, hey, you know, I'm in New Orleans. Maybe I should get a reading. You know, like like I need a reading. But, you know, hey, it's local color, I'm thinking, you know. I, I really, I wanted to get a healing you know, from a voodoo practitioner while I was there, but we weren't really finding anybody that, but everybody just had this really kind of, and I'm going to say dark, deep energy, or they were bull as far as I was concerned, and so I never did get a reading. Um, but anyway. Yeah, I, the energy of New Orleans, one of the things I'd say is because it, it, there is a great darkness to like some of to New Orleans because you know there's a lot of darkness to the history that the city was founded on the basis you know the the Indian population that lived there beforehand was essentially wiped out by like smallpox and bullets. You know oh. then the people that got there it was a huge plantation economy that was run on slavery. Then after that it was a port city that was run like you know that where you had some very, very wealthy people and a lot of desperately poor people. You know, in fact, that's a condition that still persists to this day. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, you know, New Orleans is a really pretty city, but there's a lot of really dark and terrifying stuff in the culture. I mean, I don't know if you know the story of the LaLaurie Mansion. You know, there's like the story where that, that was the woman who was like, basically got run out of town because she was treating her slaves so badly. Mm-mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, treating her slaves so badly, like, according to some of the stories, there were things like, you know, they found some of the slaves, like, chained to the walls to the point where their skin had grown into the wall. Uh, let's see, impromptu sex changes, all kinds of, like, just mutilations, like Elizabeth Bathory levels of mutilation. The house that she ran away from, as the Lori mentioned, has gone through a lot of owners. One of the most recent ones was Nicolas Cage, and we all know what happened to Nicolas Cage's finances right after he bought the LaLaurie match. We do? The place just has to, The place is, like, the place is cursed. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I don't know if I say it's a beautiful house. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful house. It's like, well, just there's so many beautiful houses in that city. Like, New Orleans, mm -hmm. just, the architecture is just so stunning. Well, and it's a walking city, too. You know, you can just yeah. start walking. I, I don't know how many miles we put on there, just walking from one place to the next, to here, to there, to there. I I loved it. Yeah, because you got, like, you can go to the Garden District, and there's these massive, gorgeous mansions. You know, you go into, like, the front row, the... the Ducare, the old city, and you've got that Spanish colonial architecture complete with the wrought iron gates and like the wrought, I mean the wrought iron porches, and that's just absolutely lovely. You got the charming little shotgun shacks in the Faubourg Manier. There's just everywhere you go, New Orleans is just like every time it's like wow, this is just like the most picturesque place in the city. But mm -hmm. like you walk another block, and it's like no, this is. 
Exactly. It is just such a beautiful, beautiful city. So one of the other things that New Orleans is, well, the most famous thing New Orleans is famous for, all right, that was a repeat word, but anyway, is Mardi Gras. Now, Mardi Gras is celebrated the day before Ash Wednesday, and what's up with that? How did that get tied to New Orleans, or is are, is the well, population of New Orleans the only ones that started. actually practice that? Oh, no, no, no. It's done all over the world. In the Caribbean, if you go to Rio de Janeiro, if you go to, like, you know, Trinidad, if you go to Jamaica, they celebrate it. They call it Carnival, or for, like, farewell, like, farewell. Like farewell to the flesh. It's because it's the 40 days of Lent when you have to fast for Lent. This is your last chance to really party. New Orleans, it started when the people who had settled Biloxi had a Mardi Gras parade. Then the people that settled like New Orleans on the Crescent the River, there, the Crescent City, had their Mardi Gras celebration. It's more a French and Catholic thing. It became really famous in New Orleans, became really famous for it because it is the biggest Mardi Gras celebration in America. It's not actually the original. There are a couple cities in Alabama. I want to say Biloxi's one of them that actually had Mardi Gras celebrations before that because people don't realize Alabama in the original, when the French owned it, the Louisiana Territory was essentially Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, today's Louisiana, good chunk of Missouri. I mean, it was like a little bit of Texas. It was a huge tract of land. But so the French celebrations, there's some older ones, but New Orleans is the really big one. And New Orleans, you know, you've got the crews going through there, and like every crew has its own history. You've got the whole thing of the people throwing the glass beads. You've got the, like, you've got the, Zulu, the Zulus with the coconuts. You've got all of that going on. And I think... New Orleans, it became really famous because, like, it's become really famous. I also know a lot of people who live in New Orleans, where Mardi Gras for a native, for a New Orleans native, is kind of like New Year's Eve to New Yorkers. I know very, very few people in the New York metro area that will go to Times Square for New Year's Eve. I know a mm-hmm. lot of people in New Orleans that are just like, oh, I don't want to be anywhere near this city when, like, you know, people come in for Mardi Gras. Because it's packed and crazy. It's packed. It's crazy. You know, you got the tourists. I know my mother-in-law, like sweet lady, is like seventy-three, was showing me, like, you know, look, you know, here's some here's some Mardi Gras beads in my collection, and I was like, Mom, I don't want to know how you got them. <laughs> Just, I think I bet they were nice ones if you weren't going to ask. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, it's you know, I think she actually got them in the store, or at least that's the story she's telling me. But <laughs> anyway, there right. is like, you know, I mean, the drunkenness and the debauchery, and it's like a lot of it, I mean, well, if you don't want to see drunkenness and debauchery, New Orleans is probably not a good city for you to go to any time. I mean, New Orleans has, since its inception, New Orleans has always been the place. I mean, the front, the western frontier was not the most exciting place on the, on, you know, on the planet. It was kind of backwards. There wasn't a whole lot of culture. You know, there are a lot of times there wasn't really like you'd li- you might live in a dry county where you might never even, like it was temperate, where you wouldn't even see alcohol, where you might not have a saloon for 50 miles around. You're going to come to the city coming down the coming down the river. You get to the city in New Orleans and all of a sudden you've got Storyville, which is like, you know, basically the city's red light district has got like you know, brothel after brothel after brothel. You got opera houses, you got music halls, you got gambling parlors, and you got booze on every corner. And so, you know, I mean, as early as the like early 19th century, New Orleans was a party city. It's been now a party city for 200 years. That there has never been a time when New Orleans wasn't famous for people coming there to drink. But you know what? You can go there and have an excellent time and not drink a drop of alcohol. You know, I think some people think, oh, well, you know, all people do is go and get drunk. But my husband and I don't really drink. Well, I I don't really drink. He doesn't drink at all. And we had so much fun. We were <laughs> we were sitting in bars on Bourbon Street at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon because they had some of the best music. 
Oh my God! Oh yeah, no, I I haven't had a drink. In, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I haven't had a drink in 16 years. You know, I go to New Orleans. What we did was you know, we just basically enjoyed the food because you can sit there you know, between the music and the food. There's like just I don't think we had a bad meal the whole time we were in New Orleans. You know, there's like you know meals went from exceptional to like wow that was good to oh God I can hardly move. So I'll share this with you and the listeners. My my husband's view of going places is to eat your way across different things. And so, like, when we went to New Orleans, we ate our way – well, one, we ate our way across New Orleans, but our rule was that you had to have gumbo on the menu or else we weren't going to eat at your establishment, you know. And so by the time we were done, we had eaten, like, gumbo at least twice a day at every restaurant that we stopped at. And – (laughs) <laughs> We're rating them, and I will tell you, um, Emerald's Restaurant, <clears throat> bam, it wasn't. It was awful. It was the worst gumbo we had the entire time, which we were really surprised about. But, um, yeah, gumbo. <sighs> so <laughs> Gumbo had, like, red beans and rice, andouille sausage. It was like, that was, the, you know, I just, like, you know, I pretty much, Eat as but like yeah, there was just so much eating. You know the beignets and beignets and coffee, pralines. There's just like yeah, you know, New Orleans is the color like you know if it's not the culinary capital of the United States, I mean it is like I would say the greatest of the regional cuisines. I mean the most interesting of the cuisine. Like you know. There's not, like, if you were to name a city in the United States that has a particularly distinctive style of food, that, like, you know, New Orleans would be, like, I think the, one of the first ones in town. I mean, for just the sheer diversity of food that's available. And, you know, because you don't have to just eat the stereotypical New Orleans food. I remember one night we had, like, Middle Eastern food. There's a pretty large French-speaking left francophone Lebanese community in New Orleans. So we had Middle Eastern food just because it's like, dear God, I really can't shove another plate of, like, you know, I can't look at another massive plate of heavy creams-covered food. And it was lovely. There was a Vietnamese place. We had some absolutely beautiful pho. They're like the beef soup because there's a big Mm -hmm. Vietnamese population in New Orleans as well. It's just like there's so much there to see. You know, I mean, that's, yeah, there's pretty much, you'd have to, try really hard not to have a good time in New Orleans. (laughs) But, you know, and you talked about it in your book, and what even trumped the gumbo, which we ate tons of gumbo, was, and we only had this at one place, was the Banana Foster. Oh, my God. And I don't remember, I don't know if the restaurant you talk about in your book is the same as the one that we went to. The restaurant we went to had been... The meeting house for when, you know, I want to say the French and Indian War, French Revolution, I don't know, some French thing. And they well, were serving. I it, was, it was, yeah, Antoine's, I think, came up with the Bananas Foster. They also came up with another dish that was sort of famous. They're like, well, you know, what can make lots like oysters more exclusive? It's like, well, you know, we'll put this cream spinach on top of them. And, of course, that's become famous as Oysters Rockefeller. But I will have to tell you. It was to die for. So if you ever go to New Orleans, go to that restaurant. It was a little pricey, but worth every penny. Oh, yeah. my God. It was like gold in your mouth. <laughs> better. Oh, it no. was yeah, better. <laughs> oh, no. There's like, yeah, you and like, there's really not like, there's really nothing like like the food in New Orleans. That's one, you know. Like I said, I, I remember some people are complaining, you know, well, you spent so much time talking about, like, the food. Well, what has that got to do with the culture? And it's like, well, the culture of New Orleans is really reflected in its food. I mean, like I said, Muffaletta, that's the story of the Sicilians who came here. You've got, like, you know, let's see, you know, again, like Antoine's with the – was it Pompano and Payette, the ones, the fish that they would do in parchment paper, which has become kind of a standard food today. You know, you've got that Creole style of cooking. You've got the jambalaya, which is based off of the, the, the Senegalese stuff. You've got, like, all of this stuff here. 
to me, you know, that's one of the things. The story of New Orleans history was as interesting to me as the New Orleans voodoo. It's like the story of how this town, like what made this town run, like what made this town work and how it all started. And the people that were involved in this town was, to me, like a lot more interesting than, say, the spoon dolls that are being imported from China and sold at the tourist shops. Mm-hmm. Anyway, but let's get back to the voodoo part. But people, you just need to go to New Orleans, and yes, the food's really good. It was definitely, um, you know, it's just the whole package because you don't get disappointed by any of it. So, but one of the um, things that I knew I wanted to see or check out, you know, was Marie Laveau. Because she was supposed to be like a voodoo queen, and she, you know, her house is still there. So of course, I had to like go check it out. So maybe you could talk a little bit about who Marie Laveau is, and where, you know, what her influence on New Orleans, or how she got to be so popular, and why people associate her with New Orleans and New Orleans voodoo in particular. Well, Marie Laveau was a Creole woman. She was actually, you know, a mulatto woman. She was born to like two free to two free people. Two, the word would be Jean de couleur in French, like two free people of color, two mixed race free people. She was married. Very. I mean, she had a relationship with a wealth with a white son of a wealthy family named Christophe Grappion, which. That wasn't really uncommon at that time, nor was it all that uncommon. She had several children by Glapion. What was uncommon was that Glapion married her. That, you know, I mean, it's, it was not unusual for a white person, for a white man to have a colored mistress. It was uncommon for the white. A lot of times what would happen is he would have a mistress until he met a white woman from, who would come from France. He'd marry her, and the mistress would be shunted off to the side, usually with like a pay, like some money. Mm-hmm. She stayed with Glapion. He stayed with her through her life until when he died. It turns out that Glapion was a loving husband, was very, very devoted. Just the poor guy had no knack for business. When he died, Marie Laveau was essentially bankrupt. So what happens? She has to start doing something to support herself and her family. What she started doing was offering like voodoo services. She had been part of the like she had been part of like what they call them the Congo Queens. She had done you know, she'd been part of that whole society. She was one of the people that was really also had a mixed clientele. I mean she didn't voodoo the voodoo services that you'd see there had tended to be largely for the black people. She actually had reached out and had clientele kind of across the board. Which again, this is the pre Civil War like this is antebellum New Orleans. This is like you know the early, like the mid early to mid nineteenth century. She had become became kind of famous with that. When she died, she was like rather elderly. She was actually written up in the paper, like in the New Orleans paper. I think it was Luf, a guy named Lafcado Hearn had written, you know, well of course this voodoo stuff is just complete superstition and it's folly, but. Marie Laveau was just a wonderful person. She did a lot of charity. Everybody in the city absolutely loved her. So she had these glowing responses. She became a time, I think, what we might call them in voodoo, like in Haitian voodoo, Zamsa, an ancestor. She had become really famous as an ancestral spirit. Then Robert Talent wrote, wrote about her again. This is in the 1940s. And he brought a lot of the stories you'll hear that, like, she was a hairdresser. She might have been a hairdresser. That was a really common occupation for women at that time. We don't know for certain. We actually don't know a lot about Marie Laveau's life. There is a lot of speculation involved. There's a lot of stories of things she did, things she might have done. We don't have a lot of really hard facts. We know where she lived. We think we know where she's buried. You probably saw that tomb. There's two or three other tombs people will go to will say, no, no, yeah, well, everybody thinks Marie Laveau is buried in that place, but she's really buried here. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's what's important, I think, with Marie Laveau is she just, there was something about that story of the voodoo queen, you know, the hairdresser who 
head like you know led to secret ceremonies by on St. John's Eve by Lake Pontchartrain, and that just I think really res- she resonated with a lot of people. It's again a lot of those stories you know are the stories about Marie Laveau. You know, be it like the great witch queen of New Orleans, are they all true? You know, well, most of them, you know, historically, maybe or maybe not. But they found such a wide audience, and, you know, they created, like, so many people who followed in her footsteps. I mean, it's like, whether or not Marie Laveau was a great witch queen or not, people have been praying to that spirit, you know, have been offering her, giving her offerings, have been asking for her help, have been getting help from her for so long. She's become a powerful spirit. Mhm. I mean, you know, you, always... you went go to the place where her tomb was, you know, or you know, supposed tomb was, and it just seems obvious that people venerated her and still venerate her and look to her for inspiration or guidance or, you know, whatever. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah, she is really you know, that's just that she is such a like has become such a powerful ancestor, such a powerful symbol. You know, she was also, I think, a symbol of a strong and successful black woman at a time when there really weren't a lot of opportunities. I, New Orleans had like um, had more opportunities for like people of color or for black people than like you know most of the southern United States did. But you were still like still there weren't really that many opportunities for somebody. You know, she became you know not just famous, probably one of the most famous. You know, I might say the most famous New Orleans first. If you ask somebody, you know, name somebody from New Orleans quick. Marie Laveau is going to be one of the first names that comes up. <laughs> exactly. So we went to her house, you know, which is now, I'll say, a gift shop, for lack of better words. What did you think about the stuff that was inside? I I, I was a little bit surprised, but I'm not a voodoo practitioner, and I really didn't know what to make of some of the really bizarre trinkets that uh, well, were everywhere. The- the thing I find interesting about New Orleans voodoo and about, like you, you say, the trinkets was New Orleans voodoo, has, there's always been an element of it that was aimed at the tourists. New Orleans has always been a tourist city. You know, there's always been an aspect of voodoo which was entertainment, which was basically people were doing it to make money, and a lot of times that involved selling gugaws. One of the big places, you know, Marie Laveau's house, there was also Algiers, Louisiana, which is across the river, is had a big community where if you were, like, black in the south, in, like, the Jim Crow days, you might go to Algiers, because, you know, you had a lot of jazz houses there. You had a lot of, like, bars where they didn't really care about, like, where, you know, they had bars for the black for black people. And they had a lot of hoodoo shops where, you know, you'd buy oil, you'd buy mojo bags, you'd buy a lot of these things. You know, you'd get you a mojo. You know, it's like the old blues song. Like, how many blues songs talk about, you know, going to Louisiana, going to get me a mojo hand? Mm-hmm. So there's always been that element of like you know there's a part of voodoo that reaches out of New Orleans voodoo that reaches out to the tourists and that like appeals to them. When I see this stuff today, you know, yeah, on one hand it is kind of like yeah, a lot of this stuff is really cheesy and a lot of it is kind of embarrassing, but it's <laughs> like you know this is the way it's always been and. You know, I got, kind of got to the point, like, it's sort of, I agree with Jean Baudrillard, you know, it's a simulacrum. It's become, you know, it's this image that was created for entertainment that took on its own reality. It's almost like a Disneyland religion. And yet, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I'd also argue that, like, you know, basically you have an American religion that started out as entertainment and a commercial enterprise that took on a life of its own. I mean, that's a quintessentially American story. Mm-hmm. Because well, like when we the were fact. there, Go ahead. when you were there, when we were there, you know, I was looking for, you know, quote unquote, a real voodoo shop. You know what I mean? With like a real practitioner, because I was interested. You know, I wanted to have an experience while I was there, and it just seemed like, you know, it was just, you know, t-shirts and okay, I did buy a few voodoo dolls to bring home to friends because. 
what else do you get? I mean, it's like getting a triangle in Bermuda. Um, you got to get a voodoo doll. But I didn't really see, you know, anything, especially, all right, we were mostly were just looking, you know, in the Bourbon Street, French Quarter area. Um, but we really didn't see anything that, to me, appeared authentic. Yeah, let's see. Some of the places that I like – there's some practitioners at Voodoo Authentica that are actually doing real voodoo. There's a shop called Erzelis that is run by a actual person initiated in Haitian voodoo. In Bywater, you have Sally Ann Glassman's Island of Salvation Botanica, which I liked very much. And I like Sally Ann also very much. She's a wonderful person. Voodoo Spiritual Temple near Congo Square, which is run by Miriam Shimani, is a really, really great place. You know, they have services there, and she does a lot of things for people. You know, the, stuff, the, the authentic stuff is there. It can be hard to find, and sometimes, you know, the authentic stuff will be, you know, I, I want to say it was at Voodoo Authentic, the place I went to that just had this wall of absolutely stunning statues from Imagines de Bahia, which is this Brazilian candomblé statue company, wall of these absolutely gorgeous saint statues and some really fascinating stuff that's really you don't see that much outside of New Orleans. You know, fabulous like spiritual books and they also have the spoon dolls. So it's kind of like a lot of times you'll find the real stuff will be coexisting with the stuff for the tourists and if you don't know what you're looking for it may even be hard to tell the difference. It was impossible for me. Yeah, like, but I, I don't really. really I was, didn't even know what I was looking for. You know what I mean? The the big finger pointing. This is a real store. Real store. No. <laughs> you yeah, know, I think there's just like there is some absolutely wonderful stuff there. But yeah, I, I absolutely can sympathize. It can be really hard because you see like so many of the same little stores and they've got the New Orleans T shirts and they got the New Orleans, you know, the New Orleans voodoo like the voodoo babies on shot glasses and you got all of that that aims for the tourists. And it's like I said, that that stuff has its own kind of magic to it. I mean it's like part of it to me was un when I started to understand that like, okay, all this stuff that appeals to the tourists has its own history, and this has been going on in New Orleans for like two centuries. That was what I was like, okay, this is, you know, this is part of the, like, you know, the zeitgeist of the city, this, like the energy of the city is, the and part of the energy is, you know, we are here for tourists. Interesting. Very interesting. Um so I'm looking at the clock, and we have about 10 minutes. Are there any um, specific, uh, like, spiritual ancestors that come out of New Orleans that aren't necessarily found in other traditions around the world? Okay, stuff that you'll see, people from New Orleans. Marie Laveau is a big one. There is, a, like, San Marone, which is the saint of the escaped slaves, that's, there's, he is a famous character who you see, like, is not really known well outside of New Orleans. Within New Orleans, is kind of like basically served by a small sect, usually, again, more the actual, like, the, the, the African-Americans of New Orleans. Not, not even really so much just plain old practitioners in New Orleans voodoo, but a lot of times the, like, the black people whose families have been living there for several generations. Some alone was like, you know, in life was a guy named Brass Coupe or Cut Arm. He had his arm blown off by a shotgun when he was trying to escape. He managed to escape after that and went out into the swamp and led a Maron as an escaped slave. He led a lot of raids on the plantations. So he's an ancestor that people will call on, you know, if you're having trouble with the law. You might call on him, you know, if there's some injustice that's been done to you and you really don't have any other recourse, you might call on San Marone to help you. That's a, he is a really big one. You'll see a lot. There's like Notre Dame de Perpetual Succour. Like, you know, Notre Dame de Pompe Succour, Our Lady of Prompt Help, is the Madonna who looks over New Orleans. She saved New Orleans. She saved the city of New Orleans from 
the like getting invaded and overrun during the Battle of New Orleans, which actually took place outside of New Orleans. She also had saved like the con her convent like the convent of prompt help saved it during a hurricane. So she's somebody, you know, you can go to like Our Lady of Prompt Succor if there's like absolute like if you've got a problem and you need a lot of like fast help. There's a big statue of Sonic Expedite there. You will see Expedite really in America became popular in New Orleans. There are other Expedite, like I would call them Expedite cults or Expedite shrines around the world, but the big one in America is in New Orleans. You know, Expedite, like I said, it's like, hurry up. St. Hurry up. He's one you go to if you need something done fast. Uh, other people from new things you'll see from New Orleans. Okay, think here. There's like that's just a few that come immediately. Right, the Black Hawk Spiritual Church that was founded by a spiritualist from like Chicago named Leafy Anderson who came down there in 1920. She said she had an Indian spirit guide named Black Hawk who wanted her to establish this church. It's been established now. You know, it's basically very similar in a lot of ways to the spiritual Baptist stuff you'll see in Trinidad or you'll see you know in the Caribbean. People will get possessed by various spirits. She used to get possessed by Black Hawks. She was possessed by another spirit called Queen Esther. And these spirits will come down and they will help people, you know, help the congregation. It's very similar to a voodoo, like the way they'll come down in Haitian voodoo. The spirit, those spiritualist churches, like the set, <laughs> spiritualism at one time was one of the biggest religions in the United States. There were more spiritualists than Methodists around the time of the spirit Civil War. It kind of died out everywhere except New Orleans, where it's still there's a thriving community there. Hmm. So that was there's just a few off the top of my head I can think of that are very like that I would say are very distinctive to the city of like very much you know their service is much more popular in New Orleans than other places. Are there any practices that are also distinctly New Orleans style? What I would say, what you see today, there's been a lot of stuff that's been brought in from the Haitian voodoo. Now, one of the main stories, there were a lot of, like, families that came over, including a lot of Jean de Couleur and a lot of white people from Saint-Domingue after the Haitian Revolution. There's not really as big a direct link to the Haitian voodoo and New Orleans voodoo as a lot of people have claimed. What came over from San Domingue and what came over after the Spanish occupation was the idea that there was a tripartite culture. I mean, in America, usually race has been done on what we kind of what was called the one drop rule. You had white people and you had black people, and if you had one drop of black blood, you were black. You had like white people, black people, and like mulattoes or colored people. In New Orleans, you had that tripartite culture, which is more like what you see in Haiti. It's more like what you see in the Caribbean. It's more like what you see elsewhere. It it was pretty much unique to America. So you've got, like, that was what really came over from St. Domingue, more than the voodoo. Voodoo practices here, well, Grigri bags are something that are kind of big here in New Orleans. They got their start when they were like back in the very early days in New Orleans when they were setting up the rice plantations, they brought some people over from Africa. Well, brought people over being euphemism for brought them over in chains as slaves, but they were from a rice growing group in like I want to say the Gambia today. And they had a habit of putting like or a spiritual practice of putting stuff together in bags along with prayer verses and, you know, they would be the men. They called them getty getties. And today they became really popular as Greek repacks. That's a New Orleans thing. Let's see. Some I, of the other ones we got. Those are like the really, that would be one of the big ones. The other one that's actually big in New Orleans is it's very similar to the hoodoo, the African-American folk practices, but it has a much more Catholic feeling to it. Most African-American folk practices tend to be rather Protestant. Because, of course, the Bible Belt is so very Protestant, like Catholics are a, rather a minority within the culture. In New Orleans, there's a very large Catholic population, so what you see is a lot of the veneration. It's where you'll see psalm magic, you might see veneration of the saints, you'll see people calling on the Virgin Mary, you'll see prayers to the 
you know, people will ask the saints to come, like a, a saint to come in as an intercessor. You'll see people asking St. Peter to open the door. That's actually a prayer you'll hear, you know, St. Peter, open the door, St. Peter, open the door. They have something, it's a call to the God, to the opener of the crossroads, leg by an Haitian voodoo, you know, leg by, leg by, and it's leg by at the door, which is like almost, the, the prayer is almost identical to the St. Peter, open the door, which you see in New Orleans voodoo. So it does sound like there are similarities, going right back to my very first question, between practices in different areas, except they're just kind of done a little bit different. Maybe you use a different uh, uh, cast of characters in different places um, to do your... Yeah, there's definitely <laughs> there's similarities. Know. You know, it's like... I don't like, you know, there's similarities. There's a lot of things that did not make it over from Haiti. There are differences, you know, in there, but there are definitely similarities. And, again, I think it's a lot of it is they're dealing with, we're dealing with a lot of the same spirits. Both Haiti and the New Orleans have a large influence on slaves that were brought over from the Bantu Congo regions of Central Africa. That's where you get mojo hands from. You get a lot of the stuff going out to the crossroads. You know, one of them that I see, like, that's an African tradition that you see in Mali is they have these people that they call the griots, and they're kind of known for sometimes they make deal. Sometimes they're considered to be sorcerers. You know, they might have deals with evil spirits, but they play these stringed instruments, and they tell all these stories. A lot of, like, the songs that they'll be telling will be about their romantic prowess or about the people that done them wrong. They tend to be done on a pentatonic scale with, like, flattened thirds and fifths. That's known among American musicologists as a blues scale. So the blues, which starts in the Delta, comes basically, you can trace the blues right back to Mali to Mali in Africa. Yeah, but just don't tell anybody that. <laughs> you know, that's like, yeah, that bear, the griots are the, were the original blues men, you know, and it's like they'd be singing songs about, like, you know, you know how my baby left me or how I, you know, I can't get my, like, you know, what I what, like, you know, my mojo ain't working no more, and I got to go get like, you know, go talk to somebody, get like my, you know, get my nature fixed, and like my, you know, my, since my baby took me, she put a spell on me, and a lot of those songs, you know, that's, you know, the Delta Blues has a very dis- definite African route, right going right back. Well, but country music and rock and roll, some aspects of rock and roll came right out of that too. Yeah, I mean, blues music is pretty much created the American, you know, created Amer- most American music has in- engages at some point with the blues, you know, either directly or through another musical tradition which got its start in New Orleans, which is jazz. Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah, I mean, New Orleans has four, like, it was one of the, uh, it's, you know, it's not as big a city as it once was, but I mean, it was once a was a major American city, as in like one of like the biggest city west of the Mississippi. It's no longer like there, but I mean, the amount of impact that city has had on American culture is just astonishing. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, our music, how much of our music came out of there? You know, one of the great, like one of the great Supreme Court cases that actually started, you know, the whole question of separate versus equal, which was like tried with a with a guy from New Orleans named Oliver Plessy, Plessy versus Ferguson, which started, you know, which basically enshrined segregation. That case started in New Orleans. You know, a lot of our history came, comes right out of, like, so much of our history can be traced back to the Crescent City. It's amazing. And one of the things that I appreciate, and we need to wrap up here, is that New Orleans has held its culture. You know, things come in, but it still has held true to itself. And, you know, even though it's gotten, you know, more, I'll say, Americanized, they haven't let go of their roots, which oh, I really absolutely appreciate. absolutely not. America, like New Orleans, has very much – it's one of the things I think I found really fascinating about New Orleans is the way it takes in all of these impulses from these – all of these – various things from different cultures it draws them in it makes them a whole part of the culture and yet 
they become part of New Orleans. Like they become part of New Orleans, and within a few years, it's like they've always been there, and they're just like, and it stays New Orleans. It's like it really is a melting pot. Like it's like a gumbo. No matter what you throw into it, it's gumbo. <laughs> And it still tastes good. <laughs> and it still tastes good. <laughs> There's the music in us. We gotta go. Thank you so well, much for it was my pleasure. I had a, a great time talking to you. I hope your audience has a good time had a good time listening. You know, thank you thank you everybody for tuning in. All right, I will talk to you later. That's Kanaz Land. His book is New Orleans Voodoo Handbook, website KanazTreland.com, and we'll be back with Jason Gregory after the awards from our sponsors. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Reed Louise, will return right after these messages. <laughs> 